My name is Tom Wang. I'm the director for the Center for Science and Diplomacy here at AAAS, as well as the executive editor of our Science and Diplomacy Journal. Um, I will not speak much at all, uh, except I did want to say that you know, we're, I'm personally so just delighted that you're all here because when we're talking about science diplomacy, um, materials don't normally come up as the first topic uh, that we talk on past. We talk about climate change, we talk about uh, issues of um, data, uh, data diplomacy, but uh, as a trained material scientist, I was really happy to, that, that uh, when I was talking to David earlier, that this uh, is in fact a, a very both timely but an important topic uh, in what we call science diplomacy. And uh, so I, I won't say any more than that and give away any more. Um, I'd just like to introduce our moderator for the day, uh, for this afternoon, Eli Kintish. Uh, I think many of you probably already know Eli or know of his writings. He um, is an esteemed writer uh, that has written for Science Magazine, but for, for other uh, very important publications, as well as a, an, an author of a book that came out a few years ago on uh, geoengineering, uh, called Hack the Planet, which is a, very, uh, which is a terrific title. So um, I'd also uh, say that Eli, earlier this year, was a research scholar in our Center for Science Diplomacy, uh, which is a program that the center hosts to, uh, to have, uh, on a short term, uh, visiting scholars that come in and do research on, on a very interesting topic. So he will actually have a very interesting forthcoming um, article, research article, on, on the Arctic and the science diplomacy there. So please look out for that. Uh, and, and <laughs> so without further ado, Eli. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, we live in an increasingly complex world, and today we're going to talk about... Um, um, There's a button on top. Yeah, thank you. So we live in an increasingly complex world. Today we're going to talk about the material aspect of that complexity. Um, a person today consumes ten times the number the amount of minerals uh, that they did at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and the aspects of that, uh, th that the facets um, of that changing dynamic between people and the earth are the subject of David Abraham's new book, The Elements of Power. I've known David for probably 12 years um, as a friend here in Washington. Uh, he worked before at the White House Office of Management and Budget, um, overseeing natural resources. Uh, he worked as an analyst on risk at Lehman Brothers and then at Barclays. Um, and he's run an NGO called Clearwater, which focuses on water issues in Africa. Um, now, uh, David is mostly based in Bali. Um, and uh, his book, I think, is going to be a very important um, part of the discussion on sustainability, materials, um, our lifestyles, as well as some of the new geopolitical and scientific challenges that face us um, as we get into a world where our relationship with minerals is much more complex than before. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for being here and uh, ask us to welcome David Abraham. Thank you very much, uh, Eli, for the generous uh introduction. I want to thank AAAS as well as Tom and Caitlin in particular for, for hosting me here. I became interested in, I've had a, a background in natural resources as, as Eli had mentioned, uh, and was brought, it, rare, rare metals came to my attention when I was in Japan in 2010. I had the good fortune of working in Japan's Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry uh, in late 2010 when China restricted exports of rare earths. And I, as one of, I counted two foreigners working in the ministry, I thought I had a great ringside seat to what was going to be one of the great geopolitical battles over, over resources, uh, one that we hadn't expected in, in many circles. And what amazed me was after China had restricted what seemed to be these obscure materials, Japan capitulated on a lot of China, China's demand uh, regarding this territorial dispute, which brought up um, the original export ceasing uh, to Japan. 
And so I wanted to, to understand what, what are these rare earth materials? Why, why are they important? So I, I did some digging and, and found out that China exports and, and produces roughly 95% or 98, depending on what you, what you, what you read, um, and that Japan is wholly dependent on China. I did some more digging and found out that they fill very critical roles uh, in magnets that are in phones um, that help with the vibration or the speaking or uh, the, uh, the vibration or the sounds. They're in wind turbines. They help make energy air conditioners that much more uh, energy efficient. There are a number of roles that they fill. So I started to do more digging and tried to learn about other materials that may fill similar roles. And I looked into indium and anemone and tungsten. And I found out that Japan and the world is really dependent on a whole set of specialty metals that we really thought not much about. And rare earths, this set of 16 or 17 metals, excuse me, came to the fore that were really dependent on a whole bunch of resources for very specific functions that we never thought much about. Now, when I look around, I, I see, I, I look at the products that we have every day and I look at the, the smartphone. And what amazes me most about the smartphone is it takes roughly half the elements known to man to make this thing. There's indium in the phone, which allows your finger to um, interact with the applications. It serves as this transparent conductor. There's dysprosium, uh, which helps with the vibration. Uh, there's even metals that help make the iPhone. There's cerium, which buffs the glass super, super smooth. So each one fills a very specific role. And without one of them, there's a problem to produce it all. So what amazed me most was that the fact that we can produce these things at all is as impressive um, as the functions that it can do. So I spent a lot of time trying to look at the future resources that we're going to need. And I look around at the growing technologies that we're seeing. And it is in the high tech area. It's in the green tech area. And as we start to push further into green technologies, as we start to need batteries in larger quantities to fill uh, various green technology goals. We really need to start to understand what it takes to make these things. So my book at its, at its very highest level is to try and give some insight into what it takes to make the materials that we need now and that we're increasingly going to need. Because there is no ingredient list on the iPhone package. And I think we increasingly need to understand what the ingredients are. Um, so we're going to talk for about half an hour, uh, and then I'm going to open up uh, the floor for questions, because I know all of you uh, came here with this particular interest, and I'm, I'm curious to know what, what your thoughts and your questions are. Um, David, uh, in your book, you write about a coming resource crunch. Uh, what do you mean by that, and what do you, th you think is going to happen? Sure. So I, I talk at the beginning about demand, that we see this demand coming. And these materials are, are wonderful things because they allow us to do so much. Scientists are just starting to play with these materials. Because unlike copper that's been around for, for, for millennia, we're just learning what these materials can do. So there's a lot of great opportunities that could come about. It's just like a chef who, under, who recently got a whole bunch of new ingredients. So the demand is there. The question is the supply. And when I looked at uh, the supply lines for rare earths, you saw that they were mostly in China. And that was because of a number of reasons, because of geo geological um, good fortune, but also some government policy. And what you see is that throughout the whole rare metal uh, industry, indium, niobium, tungsten, um, metals that are usually produced in smaller amounts, in the hundreds or thousands of tons rather than the millions of tons for base metals, is that they're really limited to a certain mine or a certain country. So there are sovereign risks uh, that loom quite large in the industry. But beyond sovereign risks, uh, what you're seeing is the challenge to set up new mines or metal processing is tremendous. And research, whether it's from the US government, from the EU, or industry, 
will show that it takes 10 to 15 years or even longer to set up supply lines. So if we're looking to the future and trying to predict the resources we're going to need in 20, 2030, that's going to be a little bit challenging. And what we're seeing right now is there's not a lot of investment going into commodities. Commodities are the prices are low, and there is a cyclical nature to all of this. But what concerns me most is that these materials are so challenging to produce that just because you have it in the ground doesn't mean you can produce it economically. So when I'm talking about the crunch, it's not can the market produce it or are we running out of these materials? It's can we produce them timely? Because my biggest fear is we're going to realize that there's a great potential to some of these resources and we can't deliver them at the right price or the right quantity at the right grade or at the right time. So a lot of these resources of the future will remain resources of the future. And because of one, whatever reason, most likely cost, we won't be employing them in a lot of green technologies where otherwise they could be used. And one other point that concerns me and is that here we are with a whole bunch of new um, ingredients to use in our products. And some of our best scientists in the world, especially in 2011, 2012, 2013, were trying to find ways not to use these materials. We're, they're the best materials for certain applications, but our best scientists are finding alternative ways. And I think that's useful if the material is in very limited quantities. But when it's a geopolitical concern, we're seeding a lot of the periodic table to elsewhere. Um, what, you, know, um, you, uh, you say in your book that um, there's a kind of uh, mismatch in supply and demand. Um, why won't the market ensure the right amount of materials reach the market, re re reach the people who need them? I think when you look at the market, it's always a, a specific, specific point in time. And I think what I'm trying to highlight is the timeliness issue. It, it's, it's producing certain rare metals is akin to producing 15-year-old scotch. It takes 15 years, 15 years to produce it. So if you need them tomorrow, unless the supply chain is already there, you're not going to produce more, more to meet the demand. So price will, will increase. There are a number of ways that capacity can increase. But my fear is that the market doesn't work timely enough to produce the materials when we need them. And because of the critical nature of these materials, um, I think there should be more thinking about um, how we can develop the supply chains. The challenge that we come about, that comes about, is who invests in these and, and how, do they, how do they do it? And we can talk about that at a later time. But it's more of the mismatch um, that I see between how supply lines can produce um, and, and do they meet demand. Because we're now um, getting to a point where products go around the world far faster than they ever have before. So an iPhone, a, a smartphone, Within, within four years, 6% of the, of the planet had, it, had one in their hand. The refrigerator, the radio, they never spread around the world that quickly. And now we're having 2 billion people enter the middle class. And we're setting up these wonderful manufacturing facilities so that products can really help lift people out of poverty. But on the same end, I would just worry about the ingredients that go in them. Yeah. Why don't you give an example of uh, a case in which um, some of these one, one of these materials led to conflict between countries, um, and, and what what happened? Well, sure, I think they've. If we go throughout history, you see certain points where materials have been a part of conflict, uh, and there's not just one instance where um, the materials caused the conflict. In terms of uh, 2010 when China restricted rare earth access to Japan, they used it as a, a, a tool in conflict. Um, in the 1970s, when there was fighting in, in, uh, in, 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 the Kong, in Zaire, there was cobalt being mined there. And there were, the price of cobalt shot up because there was fears that the Soviet Union was coming in and getting involved in the supply lines. And there was a, um, a fear 
that U.S. wouldn't have supply, and, and the combination of the war and the fear and the, and the, and the price of cobalt jumped. If we look back to World War II, you see that the U.S. was heavily involved in trying to restrict tungsten, which is a steel strengthener, uh, to, to the Germans, who were very metallurgically savvy. So throughout history, you see it not necessarily as the initial cause of conflict, but heavily involved in it. And I think what we forget is if we look back to the 1950s, in 1960s, and how heavily involved the U.S. government was in resource policy. There was a State Department non-ferrous office, a non-ferrous metals office. To think that we, we'd even have a metal office, let alone a non-ferrous metal office. <laughs> and, and we had money going into developed titanium. Uh, more money going into titanium back then than, than goes to all critical materials now. So there was a heavy focus on how do we use materials uh, for defense, but I, there was also that economic concern as well. Um, I want uh, to understand a little more for this audience that, that focuses on science policy. Um, what, what's the role of innovation? Can you give an example of a particular innovation that has helped uh, create new supply lines, make materials available, help um, process or mine the materials better? I, you can go back to the Hittites who, uh, there's, I, I think what you're looking at is there, there are breakthrough, typic break, breakthrough, typic breakthroughs that allowed for the dispersion of materials that weren't allowed, that wasn't, that wasn't happening before. And I don't know if they were necessary policy developments, but more of scientific developments that unlocked um, new, new metallurgical secrets. And I think uh, where, where science policy now lines up with that is how do we invest in the types of research that allows the breakthroughs that we need? And when I talk to people in, in mineralogy and, and material science and, and metallurgy right now and ask them what they're focusing their research on, and it's increasingly driven by uh, specific demands of the day rather than this broad um, research that may help forward um, new ideas. So if I speak to the people at the Colorado School of Mines, they don't have access to funds that allow them to do the big thinking and, and, and make the big breakthroughs. And when you travel around to a lot of these uh, processing facilities in China or, or Brazil or, or elsewhere, you, you're struck by how uh, old the technology is. And in some cases, it's very appropriate um, as one person said, we're just, you know, heating things up and, and, and breaking them. But there are a lot of opportunities for advancements in, in material science uh, and, and throughout the supply chain. Because there are a lot of minerals where a lot of these uh, elements are found that we don't know how to get them out of. So they may be in the ground, but we don't have the ability to, to get them out. For example? Uh, rare earths. Uh, they're in a number of of minerals, but we can only extract them from just a handful. Um, or we know that, or we're close to being able to extract them, but we can't extract them profitably, which is the only way for them to get to the market. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for more of the, the, the big thinking, but as someone who did work in the, in the budget office in the government, um, I do understand the competing concerns just to even stay open, unfortunately, in these days. So to get the, the money to allow us to think a little bit more broadly is sadly more of a challenge. But that means the arguments that we have to make have to be that much stronger. Um, I was struck uh, reading your book, David, at how complex it can be to obtain a single uh, rare metal. Um, could you walk us, could you choose one metal and walk us through how you identify um, it's mineral, how you mine it, uh, prepare it, the, the, the long chain that's required, and how that might require several countries okay. uh, to work. Sure. I think the, the one thing that was most striking to me, and maybe uh, this is my American education, was that when I, I traveled to some of these places and they would dig up the, show me the ore, it looked like a bunch of rocks and sand and dirt. And then I'd go to another place and it was a, 
the same rocks and sand and dessert, uh, dessert um, but just a different color. And I always thought, just like the people who'd go out west, and you would dig up the rocks, and there would be the metal, there would be the gold. And it just surprised me how much that there's a whole supply chain that's necessary just to get the metal. And sometimes we don't even need the metal. So it's the general process is you're, you're finding um, a, a, a rich ore body. You're finding the, the minerals in the ground in a high enough concentration that you think you can dig it out. Um, so if that's um, where did you go? You could give an example. So where in, you went. In, in, in China, um, I went to Baotou, which is where most of the rare, I mention rare earths a lot because that's where I have the most uh, detailed knowledge and spend most of my time. But different materials obviously come from different places. In the northern China, uh, that's where most of the one set of rare earths come, comes, comes to us. And really what they're doing there is they're digging um, iron ore out of the ground. And it's a small iron ore mine, but it's a large rare earth mine um, because usually minor metal mines are quite small. And as, as an aside, what's most interesting about that, that particular place is that they don't produce rare earths for themselves. They, they, rare earths are a nice byproduct, uh, meaning they don't, they, their costs are, of production are really tailored to the iron ore. And it's really tough for a lot of other uh, places to compete because they're, um, they're mining this as a side business. So all of the, it's, it's in some cases free or close to it to produce, these, um, to produce the, the minerals um, to make uh, the, the rare earths. But I, I jump back. So you've got, the, you've got a rich ore body in, in, in Baotou. Uh, the materials come out, uh, then they're um, grounded up and brought to a processing facility which, process, which tries to concentrate the, the minerals into more. Uh, also in Bauto? Yes, uh, an element rich, uh, uh, heavier concentration. Then the next step is to build that into um, what's, a, what's an oxide. And then um, sometimes the material can be sold at that level to someone who may need the, the, the elemental powder because an oxide is not um, something that's hard, it's more of a powder. And then it can be made into a metal either in Baotou, I believe, but I'm not 100%, either in Baotou or in southern China, where there's, a greater, where there's another processing step. Um, but some rare earth facilities, like the one we know in California, can only make the oxide. They can't make the metal. So which highlights another concern is that you could produce the, the certain material but not have the one that you need to make X product or Y product. So it's a, it's, a, it's a long chain. Sometimes it'll start in, in Russia and then go up to Estonia and then back down to Russia. Sometimes it'll start in Brazil and go. So mining is, is for, for many parts, is just the beginning. It's the question, can you make the metal, the material that you need? We've been talking about the problem. I want to turn for a couple of minutes and talk about some potential solutions as you, as you view them. Um, but before we do that, can you talk about how China, Japan, and the United States, how how their policies on this issue might differ? Sure. You, China's policy for rare materials goes back to the 19, 19, late 1970s, 1980s, uh, when they were trying to develop a hard currency. And they looked around the world and, and saw that um, what metals or materials were being in use and realized they didn't have a lot of them. Um, but they had a whole bunch of other materials that they would look at, and that was when uh, Deng Xiaoping said um, that the Sa Saudi Arabia has oil, we have rare earths. And, and really what he meant by that was we have something we can sell too. And so in the early 1990s, there was a big push to sell the materials and develop the industries for hard currency. Over time, it switched up to developing processing lines. So it wasn't just producing the material, can we process it? And basically what they're trying to do is use these materials at the heart of an economic and manufacturing strategy to produce um, not just the, the, the materials, but the components, so the components that go in our smartphones, and then eventually the end product themselves, uh, the trains, planes, smartphones, because they don't want to rely on internal components. Right now, they roughly rely on 25% of, uh, 
75, 80% of, of components to be imported. For the things they build. For the things they build. They want to change that, which has a lot of repercussions in the future. Um, so they're heavily invested into ensuring that they have secure supply lines domestically and using access to resources to help companies um, invest in the country. So if you're a component manufacturer, they want you there, and they'll give you a lot of discounts and ensure you have the resources. Japan is a little bit in flux at the, at the moment. Um, they do look at rare metals as the lifeblood of their economy and their manufacturing economy. And they're right because they make a lot of these components and heavy industrial uh, products like turbines. Uh, so they really need these supplies. And they're not, they're less afraid to put money um, uh, to ensure supply lines are strong, although that's faded a little bit. But they also invest a lot more in education uh, and giving money to, to universities to, to focus on a lot of these materials. And then there's the US, um, where there is a focus strictly on do we have enough beryllium titanium for our tanks and weapon systems. And if you want to get an ear to, to the government, you need to talk about either how China is monopolizing these resources, so we're not going to be able to fight the next war, uh, or talk about specifically our, how our, we need domestic supply lines to ensure our tanks can roll. And so it's a, it's a very different view where China and Japan look at the economics. The U.S. really looks at the, at the defense policy. I was surprised reading your book when you mentioned that um, there were 25,000 rare earth experts in the United States, I think it was 30, 40 years ago. And that's you, you said there's now 1,500. Why such a big change? And what do you think could, could, could change, uh, could turn the tide and, and develop more experts in this important area? We don't, there's been some scientific studies that show that the, 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 the fact that we're not producing a certain material has shown that the, the downstream industries have left and the researchers are not here. So when I go to China and I go to a rare earth conference, there are 500 people there all talking about how we can use rare earths for a number of applications, how we can replace rubber with rare earths. And then I go to a conference here on critical materials, and there's maybe 100 people uh, all talking about how do we not use these things, which I see is, a, as I mentioned before, a great, a great challenge. You mean find alternatives? Find alternatives. No, and not, not, use, yeah, not use certain materials, because we might not have access, access to them. So there's, I'm assuming, I wasn't around in, in the 70s researching it, that the, the morale is quite low. The conferences I go to, the people are are older than the conferences I go to when I used to focus on oil and gas. The expertise is waning. A material scientist would rather work in Facebook because it's a lot more exciting. Um, and we have to find ways to make material science and min mineral, um, the, the whole supply chain that much more interesting. Um, all those words are a mouthful to put them all together. But we have to focus on the, uh, on, on the science, um, whether that's creating um, stronger universities or funding them at a higher level. There are a number of things that we, we can talk about. Um, Please. What, what would you do if you were in charge of improving this policy in the U.S. government? Sure. One of the things that I look at, I look at Shark Tank, if you watch it on television. Basically, people come up with their new idea, and then they sell it. And, and I find the whole premise of the show kind of, I'll get back to the point of it, but I find the whole premise of the show strange is that the, the heroes of the show are the investors the people with the money. And it seems like that's, that's, we've got it all wrong. It's not the ideas, but it's the people who are, who are investing. And we have to find ways to ask the questions that get investors interested in these ma 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 materials and in the properties. And I look at Elon Musk, and he's setting up questions that are pushing the material science along. What he could help do to batteries could be tremendously helpful to the whole, the, whole, the whole world, the whole green economy, and start spurring people's interest in batteries. And I have, since, since I've started doing this research in 2010, there is a little bit more buzz about batteries. It's really hard to 
to sell because the advancement is hard to see. It's not like going into Shark Tank. But we have to get, develop that same enthusiasm for those incremental steps. Um, so on the outsiders, the, the investors asking the big questions. Uh, but I think as, as people in policy and in government, sadly, it's, it's money that ultimately it comes down to. And people talking about these issues uh, about the importance of material science and the powers that these materials uh, um, provide. And I hope that in some sense the book gives people, they have to understand what it takes to make these things. And I think that first if we can start to understand what it takes to make these things, then there can be a greater case to be made for we should really be funding these things. And if I want to take the, the, the geopolitical argument, then it would be, if we're not going to make them here, China is going to make them there. And they're going to do a heck of a lot better because they've already dominated t-shirts. They're already dominating the produ production of materials. Um, if we don't watch out, pretty soon they're going to do it to the planes. I think that's a little bit more alarmist, but it rings a lot more clearly to policymakers. Um, so just to push you a little more, when you were at OMB, you looked over a particular area. If, if this was your area, of the federal government, what sort of changes would you like policymakers to, to make specifically? Sure, I think in the, in the critical material space, uh, you saw that we set up, we, we're starting to set up the structures to allow investment into uh, critical materials. We have a critical materials hub. So what that has done is brought together a number of different institutes to come together to share information. Uh, it's a part of the federal government? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funding of the, Federal government Ames uh, Laboratory in Iowa is the, is the lead. There are researchers at MIT and Yale, the Colorado School of Mines, that come together. So that setting up the infrastructure so people talk to each other takes some time. So it's nice to see that that is there. The question is, is can we start funding them to a level um, where we can start making some real scientific gains? Because we're spending $25 million for all the critical materials when I think we spend 30 million for algae research. And algae research is great, and I'm not knocking algae research. I just think that, that these things are so important, there's more that could be, could be done here. So there is this trade-off between do we give money to research or do we give money for operations? Um, in my experience at, at, at OMB, do we set up a new program or do we give some funding out in chunks and would like to see us start to give some more money out in chunks to researchers so that they can think, what are the big things that we need to think about? And how do we, and, and, and by giving them the access to a little bit more funding, I think that would be um, a good initial start. So in, in, in kind of in summary, set up the structure so scientists can communicate and understand what's going on, and then give them the fund to think of broader research in the future. Yeah. Um, well, it's now, it's now 1 o'clock, so I thought in the next half hour we'd take questions um, from the audience. You want to take this, um, and why don't you identify yourself when uh, when you ask your question? Hi, I'm Diana Weber, a AAAS fellow, first year. Um, I'm a biologist. I should say that up front, in case this question sounds kind of naive. But um, when we mine and produce um, these rare metals. There's a lot of habitat destruction that goes on, and it creates a lot of environmental issues, human-wildlife conflict, it, I could go on and on. So why shouldn't we put our effort into finding alternatives instead of our, putting our research and dollars into you know, going toward the use of these metals. Why not? You mentioned in the beginning of your talk that there are some that we use, alter, we find alternatives for. Why not make that our focus? That's a, that's a great question, and you, and you are right. There are, mining can be nasty uh, and toxic and radi radioactive materials produced, and something needs to be done to make cities um, livable if they're next to mining places. But the question is, is what do we switch to? Uh, we're at a point where... The, the Tesla is not made from wood and, and nails. It's made from very specific materials that do very specific things. So we're, we're, we're at a situation where we're, there are trade-offs. And 
what are we willing to trade off? We look at wind turbines, and you've got the argument with the, 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 the habitat destruction to put in wind turbines. So does that mean we should just go back to coal? So these are issues that are, are challenging to think through, and I don't have all of the answers, but what I hope to do is to provide some of the, the, the right questions to be asking. Um, I wonder, does it make sense for China for producing these materials when they don't produce them that cleanly, and we could produce them here far more cleanly, but there's a lot more environmental objection to produce the materials here, but we could still produce them more cleanly. I worked on oil and gas issues, and we were, when I was in the, in the government, we were talking about do we produce off the coast of Florida? And well, the answer is if we don't produce off the coast of Florida, we're producing an Equatorial Guinea. And their oversight isn't so strong. So there are trade offs. And in all things being equal, I'd love to see the research on more organic types of materials that could be used. But if that's not the case, I, we shouldn't spend all of our time looking for the organic materials, especially if the fight for green technology is so important. So there's a balance. I think I'd like to follow up on that. I'm Paul Baker from WWN Software, and also concerned about the environmental impact. If we succeed in going into a green technology era, and I've seen so many wonderful uh, stories about how we can supply so much of the need with wind power, but wind power specifically needs rare earths. They are, there's no substitution, as far as I know. I haven't seen any work done to evaluate the impact of producing those rare earths, particularly if it stays in China. The pollution stays in China, but still, as you know, international citizens, we should be concerned about that. Is there any interface between your book and your research in, in environmental uh, community, green community? That would be my question, and any comments you have on what I said would be appreciated, too. Sure. In terms of, in terms of wind power, uh, most wind turbines themselves don't rely on rare earths. <laughs> about 20, 25 percent do. However, the, the technology is going in that direction. Um, there's discussions about how they're more efficient, they need less uh, repair, so they're less down, there's less downtime. So we're heading in that direction. Um, and the, the, there is a discussion of, the environmental issue is a, is a tough one. Um, and there is less discussion on how do we make these things more environmentally friendly to produce. One of the great challenges is how do we assess what the environmental impact is. When I look at Apple and their, a lot of their environmental impacts, it's based on CO2 emissions because they're easy to count. But how do you assess uh, the, the acid mine drainage? Or how do you assess, how do you compare the environmental degradation of one city compared to another? It's, it becomes challenging. Uh, and to make those comparisons is very difficult. So I haven't seen a good, and I'd love to know, uh, assessment of how you make those comparisons between environmental impacts in one location and another. Yeah. Hi, I'm Yusuf Butt, also a AAAS fellow, first year. Um, I had a question, which elements uh, would you highlight whose supply chain that you feel is most at risk and that you're most concerned about? Mm -hmm. And as, uh, just an add-on to that, um, what do you see as the role of recycling in all this, like recycling the cell phones? Is it, does it make economic sense? You know, should it be subsidized, et cetera? Sure. In terms of ma material risk, you look at where the concentration, where the concentration is. And Niobium, 85% of it's produced in one mine in Brazil. They've been a great supplier to the market, but if something happens in Brazil, there's a challenge for, for material supplies. Japan would say anything that comes from China carries a China risk. And we go back to China because they produce roughly, according to the European Union, 50% of all the critical materials that they define critical come from China. Part of the reason is because if it comes from China, they feel it may, may, be, may be critical. But they produce upwards of 80% of antimony or antimony, uh, indium, tungsten, a lot of these materials, rare earths. 
so they produce a lot of them. And the way they export them, um, which previously had a lot of export quotas and a lot of challenges to get them out, um, their regime is slightly changing, but there's still a lot of obstacles to ensure supply out of, out of China. Um, so if you just look in people in else, uh, people outside the U.S. would say beryllium because the U.S. dominates the market for beryllium. Uh, even though it's a much smaller market, beryllium is a lightweight metal that's used in a lot of uh, defense applications. Uh, so other countries would say, all right, the U.S. Um, so risk is really where you, where you stand. And in terms of recycling, it's a whole new issue uh, because when we – the, the grades of steel and aluminum that we use, we used to use just a few and it was easy to recycle. Now they have hundreds or close to a thousand different grades, so how do we recycle each one? When, you, when you're getting the ore from the ground, you know basically the rough concentration. When you get a whole bunch of smartphones, you have no idea what's coming in there. And it's the, they're, not, they're not used, rare metals are not used in large concentrations. They're mixed in, they're glued in, they're, they're, they're clamped down, and it's very hard to recycle products because they're not made to be recycled. They're made to be used. In some sense, we've gone backwards in our product design. I remember growing up, I played it was an NFL automatic quarterback, and I could take out the 9-volt battery and put in a new 9-volt battery. I, I knew how to do that, but somehow we lost that, that engineering feat we somehow lost with our new new smartphones. So they're, they're, I think they're product design things that we have to start making into consider, taking into consideration to make things easier to recycle. But there will always be challenges because there's very limited amounts of these materials being used. We're not very good at collecting them and dispersing them, um, and they're just so locked inside. Uh, this gentleman in the front. Is uh, yes, Barbara, you're you getting a oh, microphone. I'm sorry. I need it, too. <laughs> uh, Bob Anthony, I'm consulting now. Um, my question really has to do with your first term about consuming these materials. And the idea is that uh, if we look at future generations, a lot of these things are rare, as you point out. And, and what we're doing in many of our current applications, for frivolous reasons or otherwise, is degrading the entropy of all this and making it much more costly to ever get it back again. So where I was going is uh, <clears throat> I'm trying to think of the adaptability that one needs in lieu of the uncertainty of the applications and the criticality of these things as our science goes forward in all these areas that you've mentioned. It's very volatile. And I think the Department of Energy put out a report showing Ten, you know, factors of 10 fluctuation in market price of these as some application comes along and so forth. So it's, it's just all over the place. And uh, so the, the idea here is that if we recognize as a world that we all have a stake in this, and we don't know what's, where the blackmail might arise, where the costs and the shortages and the critical applications might arise, but that we recognize also that when we use it, we're going to disperse it and we're going to create toxicity on the one hand and products out there that are uh, dispersed. So one of the, where I'm going is really two things. One is an assessment of how critical these aspects are in the long term. What is a prudent policy nationally and internationally to, to reduce conflict and to reduce potential shortages, and also to do things like design for recyclability. In other words, think ahead of where this goes. So, for example, if you didn't own your cell phone, but you only leased it, <laughs> went back to the manufacturer, and that they, des they were, had incentives to make these t uh, metals uh, recyclable, and the same thing with with if someone is digging up a deposit of iron ore that has a high concentration of rare metals, then you somehow tax them if they don't recover it so that you create markets for the value of these and stabilize the prices. And also, in some other metals, um, what happens is in the, in the periods of low demand, you get a lot of frivolous applications coming out that are wasteful simply to keep 
the the supplier is going. So I just wanted you to respond to some of those ideas. Okay. I think you, you raise a number of really good points. Um, and I, I talk, you talk about the leasing uh, situation and how do we use products more efficiently. And that's actually one of the things that I talk about in the book is how do we, how do we set up systems, uh, economic systems, business systems, so that there's opportunity in using resources more efficiently. How do we, how do we enable a product to last longer and how that may open up more economic opportunities and not just be the death knell for, for a company um, like uh, HTC. So in, in terms of long-term policy making, which is sadly challenging, uh, one of the proposals that I, I, I put forward to try and get the international community going in, in the right direction or at least get the right conversations happening is the International Material Agency. We've talked about the International Energy Agency and what they do is they focus on energy markets. We have a lot of people focusing on energy markets. New York, in London, around the world, we pretty much have a good sen sense of what's going on in the energy markets. That doesn't mean there aren't surprises. Um, we had no idea how much coal China was going to use in the 2000s, even though coal demand is a pretty easy function of how many coal burning facilities do we have. Um, and what's the rate of economic growth? But we're not talking about these other materials. So I hope something like the International Material Agency could be a good way to get people talking about, about certain materials. Um, and then hopefully that spurs other conversations more about the circular economy, um, which you hear more about in Europe than you do in these parts, because the circular economy might need a little bit pushing along from, from uh, Either well well healed investors or a government or a government role. So the, 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 is there talk of creating an international materials agency? I hope I hope so. Let's <laughs> let's start it. Uh, it I'd like I'd like to see the, the dialogue because we the hardest part of writing this book was understanding what the heck was going on. I, I would talk to traders and they and one trader said to me, you know, the closest thing you could do is get towards the, the, the truth. Because no one knows how many materials are be, per, being produced. And the people who say up and say there's X amount or Y amount, they have no idea. And then when you start to pe speak to the real people who understand who are either trading these materials, legally or illegally, or who are paid to understand the flow, they really don't have a sense of where all this stuff comes from and how it gets to us. And because these materials are so important, I think there should be a, a greater light shown on it. And the USGS does some work, but they're a little bit overwhelmed with the number of the materials that they need to, to track. And if you're not out there, if you're not talking to people, if you're not seeing where these materials come from, or if you're not going to the facilities, you may not understand how the material gets to that facility, how it might get on a boat in Indonesia and be labeled as one thing and then arrive in Singapore or Hong Kong, labeled as something else, and then work its way into China. Um, and that had there are impacts, there are environmental impacts to that because of the toxicity or because of the radioactivity of some of these minerals. So we should understand the flow a little bit better. So that's why the IMA um, I would push. Um, I've got a number of, number of questions. Hi, <clears throat> Roman Makaya, ambassador of Costa Rica. I have two questions. Um, some of these rare earth metals are, are extremely rare, but the suppliers are even more rare. And mm -hmm. you mentioned one of them, uh, 80 or 85 percent of one of these metals, it comes from one mine. That's pretty much as close as you can get to cornering the market. But it's, it's hard to think of a market where the supplier is close to one. We've seen uh, in other areas, let's say patented pharmaceuticals being bought and, where, and prices being you know, jacked up multiple times. Why aren't we seeing that with rare earth metals where you have this natural monopoly or quasi-monopoly? That's one of the questions. The other one's completely unrelated. You, you, you say that a very high percentage of the rare earths come from China. Is that luck of the draw? Or 
are there many other countries that have uh, significant deposits of these uh, rare earth metals or rare, yeah, and, and which countries are those? One distinction I just want to make, um, when I was trying to decide, there's this whole subset of 50 metals uh, that are produced in limited quantities. and that Some people call them minor metals. Some people call them technology metals, specialty metals. Rare metals was the term I used. Uh, there, and, and a subset of them are the rare earth elements. Um, so you asked in why does China, I'll take the last question, why does China dominate the material? It's part because of geology. For some of these materials, they have them. And there was a focus on how do we produce them and get hard currency from them. So there was this uh, building up of capacity and now overcapacity for some of these materials. So, um, so it was geologic and government policy. Government policy allows them to focus on um, in, uh, investment in processing materials for, ma for metals that aren't produced in their own country. So they have a nice supply line that comes from Congo. So they produce a lot of uh, uh, tungsten, uh, uh, tantalum, um, a lot of materials that come from, from Congo. Uh, so that you've got the interplay of, of two things. In China, why, why aren't they dominating? Why aren't the prices high? There are a lot of inefficiencies in, in China. And the people in Beijing have a set of policies that they want to push. But then there are other people in Beijing and different ministries who have different policies to push. And then you have local governments who will do anything to spur the economy. So if Beijing wants to restrict um, production of these materials to raise the price, you've got competing forces that don't want to. And I think the most amazing thing to me was I would speak to Beijing officials who say, well, we can't control what's happening in some of these regions because they're far away. And I think that's, that's like people in DC saying, you know, what's going on in West Virginia? We just can't stop. They got all those mountains and hills, and we, they're going to do what they want to do. So it, it goes against the narrative that, that, China, that Beijing controls everything. But in terms of other markets, like the Niobium market, there is the sense that we're paying more for niobium. And there is the knowledge that that one, mar that one company can produce enough material to meet uh, the world's demand. And there's rumors that they let the others survive to keep a higher price because they have competition that can only produce at X, and they can produce at below X. So they keep those companies around so that they have a market price that's much higher. I haven't done the economic research behind that or the econometrics, so I don't, I don't know. But there is that concern that um, rent, higher rents are being paid, but we just don't know. Oh, the other country, it, it depends. Rare earths are, there, there are a number of countries that, that have them. Um, they just sometimes don't, don't always know. Niobium, there, there are a lot of uh, deposits out there. It might be easier to produce, but to produce economically, to go against the cheapest production in the world for possibly something you think is going to be produ um, productive in 10 years, that's not a good pitch to give it to investors. And so there's not a lot of money going f for those projects. Um, so those are the two off the top of my head. Yeah, my name is Barry Wessler. I'm currently retired. Um, the issue seems to be correctable with uh, a national inventory system for critical infrastructure or critical elements, uh, just like we did in oil production. We always keep reserves, uh, especially in times where there's oversupply and uh, critical need, later critical need. It seems to me that we can build up inventory during those times if there's a national uh, purpose for it. I think you bring up a, a great point, is how do we ensure the supplies through, through an inventory um, system? The, the challenge is that our supply lines are becoming so complex. And they go seven, eight layers deep. Ford asks. Um, radio company produce a radio, they ask someone to make the speakers, someone asks, the speaker company asks someone to make a component, and then you finally get to the metals. And 
the, the challenge with the, the inventory system is that we may, you can, we can buy the metals, but are we buying them in the right grade? And then once we do have them, do we have the industry that can actually produce them? And so if we stockpile all of this stuff, for lack of a better word, can we use it? Or are we just putting uh, cans of tuna away, but we don't have a can opener, so we don't know how to actually get the, you know, get the, get the food out when we need it? I think off of that, what we could do is find ways to get companies to inventory what they need um, rather, and this is a little, this is a lot more tricky, but how do you get companies to ensure, at least in the national security space, that they have a buffer? Because sometimes it's not the, the rare earth metal, it's that the, the, the specific grade of metal or the specific component. So if we can highlight the weakness in the supply chain and try and inventory for that, and I think the people who know best are the people who are actually using those materials, um, materials or components. Hi, Peter Uter from Genalytica. Um, in the past, you, you mentioned earlier that there once was an office that dealt with uh, rare minerals, I believe, in the State Department, and it is no longer there. But historically, where there has been an effort to preserve the ability, at least in the United States, of the country to access that which is scarce and is generally available abroad, the pressure has come from the Defense Department and not from elsewhere. I mean, going back, for instance, to World War II, uh, Nelson Rockefeller ran the rubber procurement program, uh, which was publicly explained away as being something else to present Nazi governments from, prevent Nazi governments from taking over in uh, Latin America, but in fact, was an attempt to maintain our ability to get ru uh, rubber, uh, mostly from Brazil. Is there an active effort now that you are aware of or an obvious recognition of this problem in the Defense Department? Within the Defense Department, there is a recognition um, that relying on certain materials we can only get from one place is a concern. And there are active efforts within the Defense Department um, and at the behest of Congress to figure out what's in these things. But it's not, it's, it's not easy to track where these things are coming from. The uh, Intel spent two years just to find out where one metal was coming from, or not the, where one metal was coming from, where one metal wasn't coming from, if that makes sense. So it, as long as its materials didn't come from Congo, they could say you know, that, that this material was conflict free, and it took them two years to do. This is a, we're not just talking about 2015. This is a moving supply chain, and the, and the Defense Department is the biggest user of, of, of every, almost everything in the world. So to understand where everything comes from is, is unrealistic. But there is the sense of what can we do to, um, to kind of insulate ourselves from big risks. Um, it's not a high pri priority, I think, when things are going wrong and all over the world, the first thing that someone's not going to someone's going to say is, "Do we have enough? Do we have enough beryllium?" Um, but there are people thinking about it. Um, it's just going to be another high-profile case where X material is cut off from another country, or supplies happen to be cut short um, before more money comes back into it. In my opinion. So we got time for one or two last questions, this gentleman here, and then. Uh, thank you. Glenn Langston from the National Science Foundation. Uh, a question, just, um, I mean, it's good you're raising these issues. I'm, I'm sort of a little surprised that the corporate America isn't, isn't jumping on you, right? It's sort of, I mean, you can imagine a national program that did this, but it could be very, very expensive and misguided. Whereas if a few materials were targeted as priorities that were endorsed by industry, that would make a more clearer sort of finite program to work through. But where is the, the industry uh, voice in this question? Good question. Just think the Defense Department doesn't want to get up and say, hey, we don't have rare earths to make our X missile. Neither do a lot of companies. Then a lot of companies don't want to talk about supply lines openly because then they may know what pro what's going into their products. There are very good people, very smart people. I see at conferences from a number of companies 
um, from Apple to GE to, that are trying to really look at these resources. But when supplies are plentiful, uh, there's less interest in, and, and prices are low, there's less interest in thinking, what about five years from now? Um, so they're, they're thinking, but the question is, are they, are they doing? And then what do they do? Because they don't always want to invest in a mine. <clears throat> That's not always a good use of money because a lot of companies, and they build up stockpiles, have been hammered um, throughout history when prices drop and they have to revalue the billion dollars that they've put into platinum or palladium and the market takes it and, and the market looks at them unwisely. Well, um, I think that that's all the time we have. Thank you all for coming and why don't we uh, thank David Abraham uh, for his um, oh, I just want to sell it over there. What? I can see you can purchase it over there. Tell, tell them. Oh, we, um, we have, uh, if you're interested in copies of the book, they're, they're over to the right. So we uh, take a credit card or, or cash. How much are they? Uh, they're $30. Or there's Amazon. <laughs>